Hello, everyone. On, on behalf of the Living Earth Collaborative, I'm delighted to welcome you to the inaugural presentation of our new lecture series, Adventures in Biodiversity Research. I'm Jonathan Lossis, a professor at Washington University in St. Louis and the director of the Living Earth Collaborative. Although the Collaborative is formally a partnership between Washington University, the St. Louis Zoo, and the Missouri Botanical Garden, our fellows, the fellows of the Collaborative, include faculty, curators, and others from 12 St. Louis institutions. In fact, we have 174 biodiversity fellows, and they are an extraordinary group of scientists, naturalists, and conservationists. Given this, we hatched the idea of creating a series that would highlight the work of this group and allow them to present to a broad audience. And so that was the genesis of Adventures in Biodiversity Research. Today is our first, today is our first uh, of three seminars this summer, and we will continue in the fall. I hope you enjoy today's talk and keep on coming back as we continue this series. And with that, I'd like to turn this back to Dr. Michael Moore, a postdoctoral fellow in the Living Earth Collaborative, who has helped organize this series and will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Jonathan. And thank you all uh, again for joining us here today for the inaugural Living Earth Collaborative Summer Seminar Series. Um, today, I have the distinct honor of introducing to you all our speaker, Dr. Stephen Blake. Um, I think it's important to note that when we were starting this seminar series and thinking of who we should invite, Steve's name in particular stood out for the diversity of places he's worked and creatures he studied. I'm sure that the talk he's about to give is going to show you why. Before we begin, I want to first provide a little background about Steve to those of you who have not yet met him. Uh, Steve got his bachelor's of zoology at the University of London before completing his master's and doctorate at the University of Edinburgh. Steve has had many jobs, including gorilla keeper and elephant conservation coordinator. But he is, we are lucky that right now he is currently in St. Louis working with St. Louis University. Importantly, he also coordinates the Galapagos Tortoise uh, Movement Ecology Program for the Max Planck Institute of Ornithology. Steve's research focuses on the ecology and conservation of large vertebrates, particularly with a focus on using information about the movement of large animals to improve our ability to conserve them. And this work has led to some incredibly impactful scientific publications, including in journals like Science, Nature, and PLOS Biology. Importantly, for our purposes today, Steve works on some truly charismatic critters in some of the world's most truly beautiful places, including forest elephants in the Congo River Basin and the famed giant, river, uh, giant uh, tortoises of the Galapagos Islands. Today, we're lucky to be able to hear um, some of his experiences with the field work involved both. Uh, just one last thing before I turn uh, this over to Steve. Um, it would be great if you could put any questions that you have for Steve in the comments section of the YouTube live stream. I'll be aggregating them from there and posing them to Steve uh, at the end of his talk. And so with that, um, I hope you'll all welcome me in joining Steve today, uh, however you might be doing that from the comfort and safety of your own homes. Uh, Steve, uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Michael and uh, Jonathan, and thanks very much to our dog Dixie for completing the uh, in introduction there. It's unfortunate that I can't see everyone who is um, attending this, um, but I will do my best to make this as informative and hopefully entertaining as we can in the hour we got. Um, so I look forward to talking to you at the end. Um, since it's hard to interrupt uh, this for questions during the presentation. All right, thanks very much for inviting me to give this. Thanks for turning up and uh, let's go. Hopefully the dog won't uh, try and bite the postman anymore. All right. So the title of this talk, I've sort of given a similar talk before at SLU, but um, wanted to try to wrap up some general themes of some of the research and travels that I've been fortunate enough to do. And when Jonathan asked me to give this talk, he, or rather the postdocs and Jonathan asked me to give this talk, they wanted something that was not quite sort of your dry scientific presentation, but something that could sort of link um, themes in large animal research and conservation and interesting, exciting locations around the world. And I've been fortunate enough to um, have some exciting times in life and hopefully share them with you through 
um, sort of the lens of, of Gulliver's Travels, if you like. So my title, Forest Elephants, Galapagos Tortoises and American Bison, Travels in Lilliput and Brobning, Brobding Nag. So if you've never read Gulliver's Travels, you've probably heard of Lilliput, but you might not have heard of Brobdingnag. So I'll try and do my best to explain why it's appropriate. So Gulliver went, went around the world. And of course, in, um, in Brobdingnag, uh, in um, Lilliput rather, he was a giant um, among tiny peoples in a tiny environment. And in Brobdingnag, of course, he was a dwarf in a, in a world full of giants. And I've been lucky enough to work with um, species like forest elephants and Galapagos tortoises. And alternatively, I felt a bit like Gulliver, surrounded by giants, and if you like, giant dwarves, if that makes any sense. So Brobdingnag, surrounded by giants, forest elephants in um, giant forests, we'll start off, we'll start, uh, sort of kick off there. Then uh, I was lucky enough to find myself on the Galapagos Islands in uh, uh, Lilliput. And well, Missouri, let me get rid of that little thing. Whoops. Let's go back one. Missouri, outlaw juicy Wales country, I'm not quite sure where that sits in the two. So we'll start with forest elephants. So there are two species of elephants in Africa, um, forest elephants and um, savannah elephants. Forest elephants found in West and Central African um, dense forests. And there are very few um, elephants like this uh, old boy on the left-hand side here. Uh, I think he was called uh, uh, Baghdad and had some of the biggest tusks of any um, adult elephant left in the Congo Basin at that time. So a good place to start this sort of travels through uh, a, um, a couple of continents and a few species is with the 1989 ivory elephant trade ban. And the ivory trade ban was set up in 1989 because in the, in the 70s and 80s, Africa had lost about half of its elephants, according to Ian Douglas Hamilton and various other authors. Uh, killed mostly for the ivory trade, some human population expansion, some loss of habitat, but mostly for the ivory trade. And markets such as this across Africa were um, commonplace, lots of ivory being um, exported, particularly to Japan in those days, but to many different destinations around the world. And ivory was big business. Probably half a million elephants died in those decades. Then Kenya in 1989 um, took up a stand and said, enough, we're burning our ivory. We're lobbying for an international trade ban on the sale of ivory to make it illegal. In the hope that this would stop elephant poaching uh, or at least slow it, um, reduce the trade, reduce the demand and therefore reduce poaching in the woods and give elephants some breathing space. In 1989, I was far from Africa and wasn't even considering ever going to Africa, never mind uh, working there for the best part of 20 years. I was um, uh, playing with gorillas in England in those days in a zoo called Howlitz. One of the only zoos in the world where we, we as keepers are able to go in with adult um, um, like gorillas. And I got to ha hang out with orphan gorillas and uh, whose, whose, whose mothers had rejected them, which is relatively frequent in zoos, um, infrequent at Howlitz, but uh, nevertheless, I got some experience bringing up um, baby gorillas. At that point, I was aware, but didn't know a great deal about uh, the trade in orphan, orphan um, great apes, and indeed the bushmeat trade for um, meat uh, sales within Africa. So chimpanzees in cages being sold in markets was rather commonplace in Central Africa at that time. And the gorilla bushmeat trade was alive and well, as of course it is um, today. So we got to hear about these, these events in Howlets and the zoo decided um, to set up a gorilla orphanage with the long-term objective of combating the orphan gorilla trade, combating the illegal trade in gorillas and uh, setting up a re 
introduction program. And I was lucky enough to be asked to go out to Brazzaville in the Republic of Congo and join the team working on that project. And this uh, gorilla on my shoulders is a, uh, a young male of about two years old called uh, Sid in, in uh, the Brazzaville Zoo. His mother was killed by poachers. He came to us with shotgun wounds under his under the um, uh, shotgun pellets um, under his skin, rope burns around his groins um, in a terrible physical state. And it was part of our job to nurse him back to health and eventually, hopefully, reintroduce him and other orphan gorillas like him um, back to the wild. While I was working in Brazzaville, I was, I was very motivated to work for gorilla conservation and to work for the project. But I kept hearing stories about the Northern Congo, the interior of the Congo, and growing up sort of with one eye on the TV, watching Tarzan movies when I was, when I was young, something about that dense forest in the interior of the country um, excited me. And I heard stories of places like Lac Telly, this round, mysterious lake in the middle of the Likwala swamps, biggest swamp, uh, biggest forested swamp in Africa, and uh, the Congo monster that was supposed to live there. So these stories filled a young Boy Scout mentality like mine, full of um, the desire to get up and experience um, some of these areas. As luck would have it, Brazzaville is quite a small place for the expat um, community. And I met one of the most inspiring people I think I've ever met, a bloke called Mike Fay of uh, National Geographic fame. And he was there working for the Wildlife Conservation Society to develop a national conservation plan with the Congolese government to bring national park creation and management, forestry management and resource management on a national scale, focused on um, an area called the Nuabali and Doki Forest, which Mike and uh, the government wished to designate as um, a national park. And Mike was full of stories of the Ndoki and its naive chimpanzees and its sitatunga and gorillas coming out into large forest clearings so that you could observe them freely. Forest buffalo and of course, forest elephants. And Mike had just finished his PhD on Western lowland gorillas and was now fully on for this project. So I was trying to chat him up for a job. He said, Steve, you don't know anything. Get yourself a master's degree, which took me to Edinburgh University for a year. And for the project, uh, I worked, I finally got to those, the koala swamps and studied, uh, did a, um, a baseline survey of swamp gorillas. Gorillas were well known to inhabit dry tropical lowland forests and Mike had done some preliminary work in uh, swamps and seen that gorillas were in the swamps during uh, the dry season. But big question unanswered was, could these gorillas hang out in these vast swamps during the wet season? So uh, young and naive, I did a hundred or more kilometers of transects up to my uh, uh, thighs and stomach in uh, tea colored water. And lo and behold, the place was full of Western lowland gorillas. And um, we managed to write a little paper on that, swamp gorillas in the Northern Congo, and showed some uh, preliminary data on gorilla densities with distance from villages into those vast swamps. And lo and behold, as distance from the village increases or distance from a road increases, the abundance of gorillas increases uh, dramatically. So that got me my master's degree and a ticket, as luck would have it, to get back to the Ndoki. And when I started working um, in the Ndoki, which is uh, this little uh, 4,000 odd um, uh, square kilometer former logging concession, now National Park, thanks to the effort of Mike and the WCS and government team. Um, very little was known about wildlife abundance in and around that area. Uh, very little was known about poaching levels, who was killing elephants, who was doing bushmeat trafficking, where the good stands of timber were, et cetera, et cetera. So one of my first jobs um, was to basically get out and explore 
um, within the proposed national park and the peripheral zones around it to bring in quantitative data to understand a little more about what was going on with wildlife and with forest integrity and habitat quality around the park, around the proposed park. With a big focus on the large mammals, elephants, gorillas, bongo, sitatunga, chimpanzees, etc. So over the years, we refined some survey methods from basically just long walks in the park, collecting reconnaissance survey data and counter rates of animals per square kilometer walked to somewhat more refined uh, surveys using things like distance sampling to keep the statisticians happy. And lo and behold, after a few years of traipsing around the, uh, that part of um, Congo and Central African Republic, we were able to stick those data into GIS and draw maps such as these, where um, elephant dung density clearly increases with inside national parks and decreases dramatically with distance from the national park and is almost perfectly juxtaposed by the abundance of human sign. So basically where you've got high elephant abundance, you've got very few or no human activities. And as human activity increases, elephant abundance declines to close to zero. So those sorts of surveys and those sorts of data really opened our eyes or, 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 or perhaps refined our view of um, human impacts on large mammals, particularly elephants. So I was fortunate enough after that work and um, a PhD that came along during that time um, to get a job with the Wildlife Conservation Society. And part of my role um, with the Wildlife Conservation Society um, at WCS was to coordinate um, elephant surveys for um, the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species, um, CITES, so-called MIKE program, Monitoring of the Illegal Killing of Elephants. And in the second iteration of that project, which I was responsible for coordinating across several countries from the Central African Republic to Democratic Republic of Congo, to Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, Cameroon, and um, um, Gabon, was to implement elephant surveys to um, quantify elephant abundance and to try and get some handle on rates of illegal killing of elephants. So with a group of colleagues, I set up uh, surveys in these different zones trained uh, local wildlife officers in survey methods and coordinated surveys across these regions. And just to give you an idea of the scale um, of some of those surveys, if we look at Salonga National Park here uh, in the middle of Democratic Republic of Congo, that's something like 50 odd thousand square kilometers. So huge areas over which to be trying to estimate elephant abundance. And this kind of squiggly line running through some of these uh, Mike Sighty sites uh, further to the west is the mega transect, this, this crazy idea that again, Mike Fay had to, uh, to walk across the Congo rainforest and collect data on wildlife and human activities um, as he went. So we spent a year or two collecting those data, analyzing them, writing them up, and lo and behold, oh, I'll try and get rid of that. That work resulted in a first uh, paper, uh, Forest Elephant Crisis in the Congo Basin, that came out in PLOS Biology and said essentially this. If we look at the graph on the left hand side here, we've got re relative elephant abundance on the y axis and the distance to the nearest protected area on the x axis. So if you're well within a national park, 50 kilometers within a national park on the far left, Elephant abundance is really high. You get to the park border, it's dropped to low levels. After that, big confidence intervals, but it declines further. Then if you look at relative elephant abundance against distance to major road on the um, right hand graph, obviously these two graphs are not completely independent. Distance to road often indicates distance to protected area border. We see that as um, the distance to the major roads increases, 
elephant, elephant abundance increases um, like dramatically. But it's not until you get deep within the forest, 50 or 60 kilometers away from the nearest road, the nearest access, that elephant abundance approaches something like its former uh, norms. So even in the heart of the Congo Basin, um, forest elephant abundance was being determined by human activities. This had been known for some areas within the Congo Basin, but not really across the area and to the extent that we realized within those mic surveys. So that was some useful data that could help to guide perhaps conservation measures in the future um, to protect elephants and try to reduce illegal poaching. So of course, dung piles are not elephants. You can count piles of elephant dung to your blue in the face, but they're still not elephants. And so with the help of a, um, a large team of um, um, collaborators from PhD veterinarians and wildlife biologists to um, pygmy trackers that could neither read nor write, but all of whom should have a PhD in ecology, um, we put together um, a program of elephant uh, telemetry across the across parts of the Congo Basin, starting in the Nuwabali and Doki National Park. And here's a uh, wildlife vet, uh, Sharon Dean, with the first elephant that we immobilized together, um, a boy named Sue, in the heart of the Nuwabali and Doki, as it was National Park then. What did we find? We tagged elephants in several sites, Nuwabali and Doki, the Odzala National Park, the Minkebi National Park, Vindo, Lope, Luango, and Gamba in uh, Gabon, Congo, uh, Central African Republic, and Congo again. And we found that forest elephants range over very considerable distances, with home ranges up to uh, two and a half thousand um, square kilometers, about half the size of the Nuwabali and Doki National Park. And parks throughout the range of elephants uh, in, within the sample, parks are simply too small for forest elephant populations. If we look at uh, the home range here of um, uh, a sample of elephants from the Nuwabali and Doki, we've got national park area for all of the national parks in Central Africa on the y-axis and the name of those national parks on the um, x-axis. We can see that in red here, these parks on the right, pretty much half of the parks within Central Africa, the national parks, are smaller than the home range of a single Nuwabali and Doki elephant. And the majority of parks are smaller than the home range of a sample of four elephants collared within the Nuwabali and Doki. Only a few parks are really of, of, of sufficient size to hold the home range of um, a small group of elephants. And of those parks, Salonga South was in real trouble. Salonga North was in terrible trouble. Adzala was doing well. Maiko in Eastern DRC was experiencing very heavy elephant poaching. So most of the areas that were of sufficient size to support an elephant population were experiencing very heavy poaching levels. And if we look at the home range data from those tagged elephants across their range, and we correlate home range size with roadless wilderness area, we see that as roadless wilderness area increases, elephant home range size increases pretty much in a, a linear fashion. There's no asymptote. And it's very probable that throughout Central Africa, throughout the range of um, forest elephants, nowhere uh, are elephants able to range freely, unconstricted by human activities. And of course, why is that the case? Why are elephants um, so concerned by roads? Well, roads bring bulldozers, bulldozers bring logging trucks, logging trucks uh, and roads bring um, poachers and um, in close proximity to roads, poaching levels are highest. And so elephants flee from roads and are poached out close to them. And you may think, well, this logging road going through the middle of nowhere, you know, a few trucks a day, big deal. And yet um, a small number of um, poachers can, can, can cause um, havoc to um, forest elephant populations. 
And one of our tagged elephants in um, Odzala National Park was tagged for coming on for a year. And if you look at her daily travel distance, normally she travels less than five kilometers a day throughout the time that she was wearing a tag. On three occasions, she absolutely legs it over a 24, 36 or 48 hour period. In each of these peaks with the um, red uh, diamond signifies the only three times in that year when the elephant crossed the road. So she was basically plucking up her courage, deciding to cross the road and then bolting across the road until she got a good distance out the other side. So wilderness um, loss is extremely important and road proliferation is extremely important if elephants are going, going to be able to maintain the sorts of movements they need to do um, uh, to, to access resources. But of course, road construction isn't, isn't diminishing. In fact, road construction is um, increasing, accelerating across the Congo Basin as new investment comes in for mining, for timber, for other natural resources, roads are being built into previously wilderness areas, opening them up for exploitation, not just of legal uh, resources, but of illegal products such as ivory. And of course, if elephants are lost from ecosystems, lose elephants and you lose the ecological interactions that elephants bring. And elephants are often called a keystone species that have a, a disproportionate impact on their ecosystems or an ecosystem engineer. And some of the work that I was <laughs> lucky enough to do involved analyzing about a thousand piles of elephant poo and counting all the seeds bigger than about a centimeter within them. And lo and behold, Elephants eat about, uh, well, well over 100 species of um, fruit and, dis and disperse the seeds of those 100 or more species in a nice little nutrient rich grow bag. And sometimes there's up to 16 different species of seeds in the average pile of in, in a, um, um, a pile of elephant dung. But the mean is about uh, four or five species of seeds per dung pile, but thousands of um, seeds of those species um, collectively. So elephants are planting the forest essentially. And we wrote a little paper in Biotropica um, a few years ago saying just that. Because of the distances over which elephants move, those long distance movements that we found from the GPS telemetry data, and the quantity of seeds that they ingest, they're moving way more seeds over far greater areas through, through the forest than any other um, species and indeed any other um, genus of, of, uh, of uh, species. So elephants are playing a critical role in planting and gardening the forest. A collaborator, Fabio, uh, came out with a nice paper last year where he took some, he, uh, he, uh, he looked not at seed dispersal, but at um, elephant browsing and use some of my data, to, or our data, sorry, to um, um, corroborate his model. The model said elephants are preferentially browsing on fast growing um, species of tree, fast growing woody species, and they're leaving the slow growing woody species. What this does, says the model, is um, leads to, um, in forests where elephants are present, elephants are shaping the um, structure of the forest community by preferentially uh, browsing on those fast growing species, leaving the slow growing species um, uh, to grow. And it turns out that the slow growing species have um, high wood density and therefore high carbon content. And it turns out, cut a long story short, that forest with elephant, elephant rich forest um, tends to, uh, or is able to stock far more carbon than an elephant poor forest because of those browsing um, interactions caused by um, elephant feeding.
Okay, so uh, I was well into the Congo after about a decade and a half working there. Had met uh, the wildlife vet who uh, tagged the initial suite of elephants for us. But that wildlife vet, Sharon Dean, was um, in demand around the world. And had been working not just in the Congo, but in perhaps 20 other countries around the world doing wildlife stuff. And lo and behold, she was offered a job out on the Galapagos Islands and suggested that we move to Galapagos. Well, there we are, on the other side of the world. But it was better than moving to, to uh, Detroit and uh, have her uh, castrating poodles the rest of her days. So we up sticks and moved to the Galapagos Islands. And Sharon got a job working on avian disease ecology on Galapagos. So after 17 years in Brobdingnag, we went to Lilliput. And Sharon was working away, catching birds and doing all sorts of disease stuff. I, on the other hand, had drinks with umbrellas and the beach. No elephants on Galapagos. Uh, in, finished, finished up my elephant job and was very happily ensconced on the Galapagos with our lad Charlie um, having as much fun as, as we could. And then I met this chap, Martin Wikowski from the Max Planck Institute of Ornithology, whose sort of goal in life is to put GPS tags on as many animals from as many species as he possibly can and work out the mysteries of animal migration and animal movement more generally. So all of a sudden then, those drinks with umbrellas in the beach became lava sulfur springs and giant tortoises. But another opportunity, opportunity to be out in the woods where I love to be. So I talked to Martin and he was intrigued by this story of that dates back to giant tortoises, uh, that dates back, sorry, to Charles Darwin thinking about giant tortoises and why do their trails go up and down the volcanic slopes of the islands? So he asked the locals and the locals said, well, tortoises migrate up and down the islands um, over the year. So we were intrigued by this. Why would a 600 pound tortoise run up and down a volcano every year? didn't seem plausible. So having had some experience tracking forest elephants, it was relatively straightforward to get some plumber's epoxy and put some GPS tags onto giant tortoises. The tag store data, we use radio tracking to, to, to relocate the tortoises, download the data. And in this case, uh, data from this uh, probably 150 year old tortoise are being downloaded by a chap called Randall Keynes, who's Charles Darwin's great great grandson. So it's a lot of fun being out in the woods with him, downloading data from wireless from a tortoise that was probably migrating already when Darwin was writing on the origin. So lo and behold, a year or two's data, and we end up with giant Serengeti tortoises. Tortoises on Santa Cruz undergo these seasonal migrations up and down the volcanic slopes, just as the locals had told Darwin. But importantly, they leave the national park for a portion of the year and enter private farmlands designated by this uh, red uh, um, polygon. So the tortoises leave the national park and go into unprotected private lands for a portion of the year. So what's the migration all about? Well, if we look at this top graph, we can see in October or so, this particular tortoise is about 160 meters elevation. All of a sudden, come mid-October, decides to migrate to an elevation between 400 and 450 meters. Hangs out for a few months and then migrates back down to the lowlands and repeats that on this beautiful annual cycle. So what's going on? Well, if we look at the bottom graph and look at the blue dots, we can look at uh, the blue dots signify um, lowland rainfall, so rainfall near the coast. And when rainfall near the coast peaks in February and March, that provokes a peak in vegetation productivity within the lowlands, designated by these um, green uh, squares. So um, rainfall increases, 
productivity in the lowlands increases. And it's exactly at that point that the tortoises um, descend to low elevations to fatten up on that nice, new, green, lush, nutritious growth. The rain stops, vegetation dries up and blows away, and productivity declines and declines until a point when the tortoises have had enough and migrate to the highlands, where, because the highlands are always moist, there's always year-round productivity and a dependable, sure, fallback food resource. But of course, these tortoises are leaving National Park and entering private lands where they encounter uh, some obstacles if their migration is going to continue, such as fences or our farmers' fields, roads and an increasing volume of traffic and barbed wire fences and things, and uh, an increasing tourist trade, and changing land uses as more farms are becoming uh, production farms for things like coffee, um, and other crops, uh, land use is changing that, has, that may have some impacts on the tortoise migration. We wanted to get to the bottom of the bioenergetics of this migration and, and yep, tortoises are moving in response to food, but what does this really mean in terms of their, ener their, their energy budgets over an annual cycle? Luckily, we're not going to worry about this because I don't understand a word of it. And my friend Charles Yakulik developed the lot, but he came up with a bioenergetic model of tortoise migration. And some predictions, excuse me, spam risk. Some predictions came out of that model. If we look at um, migration as a strategy, compared to a tortoise being resident in the highlands year round or being resident in the lowlands year round, we find some interesting patterns emerge over body size. So we've got mass on the x-axis here. Annual surplus in kilos, basically how much fat a tortoise can put down. And if we look at a tortoise with a highland strategy, a small tortoise is doing worse off in the highlands compared to the lowlands or a migratory tortoise. If a tortoise gets to a certain body size, about 150 kilos, then it's better off being in the highlands year round compared to the lowlands. But importantly, a tortoise of about 80 kilos is better off and puts down a greater annual surplus, energy surplus through the year if it migrates below 80 kilos the tortoise is better off remaining in the lowlands. And lo and behold, this is exactly what our empirical data demonstrate. The model also said that uh, through the year, a tortoise of, um, in, in the upland migration, tortoises of large body mass should migrate earlier than tortoises of lower body mass. And that's basically because they run out of food more quickly. If you've got a large body, okay, you're more efficient, you, you're, 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 you're more efficient, but you still need a large absolute volume of food. So when food begins to decline, a large tortoise is going to be more sensitive to that than a small one. So they should migrate first. And lo and behold, if you look at the gray um, modeled arrows relative to the purple actual arrows, you see that the two um, are very closely aligned. So it seems there's some merit in this model. Now, if we look at the descent to the lowlands, everybody should migrate round about the same time when the lowlands green up, and that's exactly what seems to happen. No correlation with body size there. We can sort of explain this to some extent. Again, if we look at this daily surplus or deficit, and we look at uh, food availability on the x-axis, in terms of so-called NDVI, just substitute that for the availability of food. A small tortoise doesn't really respond to a, uh, an, an increasing food supply because a small tortoise has already got enough to eat, even when there's not much food around. A large tortoise, when there's no food around, is going to be in energetic deficit. It simply can't eat enough until food availability reaches um, a point where um, it's, it's, it is going to exceed 
the daily surplus that a small tortoise um, can obtain. And essentially, uh, a large tortoise is really never saturated with food. Now, if we look at those two strategies, remaining sedentary in the lowlands year round or remaining in the highlands year round for a small tortoise, the model tells us we're better off in the lowlands year round. A large tortoise, if it remains in the lowlands, is going to go into energy deficit around about September and build up this large deficit that we see in the sort of bottom right of this graph. It's going to be OK in the wet season. It's, it's going to do very well. But if it adopts a migratory strategy, it's going to be in the lowlands when there's plenty of food around. Whoops, beg your pardon, let's go back one. Then it's going to move into the highlands and maintain that positive energy balance year round. So a migratory strategy wins out over either of the sedentary strategies. So all this points to um, fitness consequences for migration versus being sedentary. And we wanted to look for some evidence for the field to back up this model. Couldn't really measure fitness directly lifetime reproductive output in a giant tortoise is a hard thing to measure. But we can get some indices with things like um, um, body uh, condition index, blood samples to give us things like total solids and protein content of blood, etc. And ultrasound of females to look at eggs and follicles to get probably the, 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 the best um, index of um, fitness. And it turns out migrators have higher body condition index than non-migrators in the field, backing up our, in our um, theoretical model nicely. And lo and behold, if we look at body condition index versus the proportion of females with eggs or follicles, clearly, as you'd expect, as body condition increases, the probab probability that you're going to have eggs increases. So the model nicely backed up from empirical data showing that this migration is really important. So if the migration is blocked by things like changing land use and roads and other barriers, then tortoises are going to suffer a fitness hit. So some nice strong conservation implications coming out of that. We expanded the study to look at uh, tortoises across the Galapagos Islands, from arid islands with saddleback tortoises to very uh, wet islands with dome-shaped tortoises, and ended up tagging well over 100 tortoises on, on three different islands, El Cedo Volcano, Santa Cruz Island in the west and the east, and Española Island. And I'm not going to dwell on this because I'm talking too much, but essentially we, we found, in fact, ignore that graph for now. We found um, tortoises display all of the main movement strategies and that those movement strategies depend on the environmental influences um, that uh, the tortoises are facing. So tortoises can be nomadic in unpredictable environments. They can be uh, migratory in predictable environments where um, um, there's a um, oscillation in the geography of food production, or they can be sedentary and have home ranges when there's not much spatial grain in terms of food production through the year. Just like giant tortoises, are, uh, just like elephants rather in Central Africa, um, giant tortoises are gardeners of the Galapagos Islands for basically the same reasons that our forest elephants. They eat large quantities of fruit and they disperse large quantities of seeds over very large distances, unfortunately, including numerous invasive species. All right, so the, the vet in demand was also in demand and was after being on Galapagos and was asked to come uh, to St. Louis uh, by the St. Louis Zoo and set up the Institute of Conservation Medicine. So for all of us as a family, uh, that meant uh, pastures new again. 
And when we landed in St. Louis, I was lucky enough to run into Alan uh, Templeton down at WashU. He said, you, you've done some work on animal movement. You should call the people down at Dunn Ranch, the Nature Conservancy, and see if they want a hand with their bison. So I took his advice, called the people at Dunn Ranch and said, do you want a hand with your bison? I've worked with elephants and, uh, and uh, giant tortoises. And rather than tell me to clear off back to England, uh, they were fully supportive of the idea. I should say at this point, I'm very, not very proud at all of my uh, uh, um, foray into bison research. I feel like I've let down the Nature Conservancy rather, rather badly. And uh, since I got a job at SLU essentially, and I've had to uh, uh, learn how to teach courses, um, I've had rather less time for doing research and uh, the bison project never really got off the ground. But we got some nice preliminary information that I'm going to uh, share with you now, briefly. So like those vast forests of Central Africa, I've been intrigued by the Great Plains of the United States. In fact, all of the ecosystems and the, the continent of the United States is, is just endlessly fascinating in, in um, ecological terms. And tall grass prairie, as you all know better than I did, once covered about a third of of the contiguous US. And central tall grass prairie was a small component of that. And the Dunn Ranch occurs on, in the central tall grass prairie. And it's a small ranch, a few kilometers by a few kilometers, but importantly contains the biggest patch of deep soil unplowed prairie left uh, that anyone knows about. And so the Nature Conservancy is part of their management strategy to, to, to restore ecosystem function to the ranch, we introduce bison. But bison in, a small, in a, a small area demands the question, well, how many bison is enough to, to, to restore ecosystem function, to maintain habitat heterogeneity and not just trash the place? So I had a word with Martin, that chap who uh, wants to tag everything and asked him if he had any spare uh, GPS collars. And as luck would have it, he just had a project in the Serengeti fall through on zebra and had 10 zebra tags that we uh, quickly modified and put on some bison. And in my mind's eye as this sort of boy scout from England, this is the sort of thing that I imagined I'd be doing out at the Dunn Ranch with the, the Nature Conservancy crew. But of course, we got trucks and power tools now and catching a bison isn't all it used to be. But eventually we got some GPS tags on the bison. And lo and behold, after a, a year or so of data, we find this incredible mosaic of use intensity over the ranch from ultra high intensity use areas in some areas to basically no use in others. And this sets up a very interesting gradient in, in, in bison ecosystem impacts. And if we can measure the um, intensity of use of bison and relate that to ecosystem characteristics, we may be able to come up with some semblance of a, um, an answer to this question of how many bison is enough in a small, prairie fragment to maintain habitat heterogeneity at a scale to encourage uh, prairie birds um, and uh, high diversity um, prairie flora. And this lends itself on, or this, this comes under this sort of intermediate disturbance hypothesis. Too few bison, they're not doing much to the ecosystem. Too many bison and they're trashing the place an intermediate number should increase heterogeneity and maximize biodiversity. And that's what the Nature Conservancy are interested in doing. So we got to the point of looking at all the land uses on the ranch and putting in a uh, hundred or so um, vegetation plots, these little white dots here, to um, map the um, species composition and the community characteristics across a swathe of the ranch and try to compare those patterns of diversity to bison use. 
this is a work in progress um, that hopefully will write up one of these days. Um, but I don't have any results for you right now. So in summary then, um, you know, what can we say about Brog Brogdingnag and Lilliput and Missouri and this and that? Well, human beings are endlessly fascinated by large animals. And those large animals really hold important places in human society, culture, economics, and in our uh, spirituality and uh, religion. But enjoying large animals is really a luxury of the wealthy. And these large animals are often major ecosystem engineers, which if lost from ecosystems, send cascading negative impacts through ecosystems. And unfortunately, when human pressure increases in areas, large animals are usually the first to go. And with them go their myriad ecosystem processes. Declines continue today. How are we going to develop and implement win-win situations for wilderness, agriculture, resource extractors, ecological integrity, economies, and megavertebrates in their ecosystems themselves as our human population grows to 10 billion? Mo monumental and important question. And when I think about what good I have done, I'm rather confused. I've tried hard, I've had lots of fun, written some nice papers, but how much land have, has been saved due to my activities? How many individuals or populations have been protected and had perhaps their uh, population trajectories, um, the, the decline of those trajectories slowed or even increased? I don't know. Um, uh, and I dwell on this question a lot um, as uh, we seek answers to these um, questions. And with that, I will uh, end and hopefully chat with you if you're still listening. Thank you very much. Terrific, thanks Steve, that was really interesting. Um, while we wait um, for some more comments to, to build up here, um, we, have, we have one that I think is particularly relevant. Um, and that's from Professor Lostas. And he, he was interested in, in having you compare some of the challenges of sort of radio tracking the elephants versus the tortoises versus the bison. And, and I know I particularly was interested in, in thinking about, well, how, how difficult is it to, to keep the trackers on the different, on mm -hmm. the different critters? Yes. Um, um, uh, elephants, it's, a tricky business, obviously, and you need a team of, in, of very highly skilled um, pygmy trackers to find elephants once they've been um, shot with a, um, a dart gun. Then experienced wildlife veterinarians to, to look after the animals while they're asleep. Um, putting on the tag is just sort of mechanics, but um, the whole process is, is, is is difficult and requires a very specialist crew. Giant tortoises are slightly easier to get hold of, and uh, you can glue on GPS tags with uh, plumber's epoxy that you can get from Home Depot. So that's a little uh, less uh, 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 stressful. Um, bison, kind of somewhere between the two. It, it, it would be a lot trickier if we were uh, cowboys on horseback with lassoes instead of uh, having crush crates and uh, and uh, power drills. Um, another question here. Um, so how much um, sort of individual variability is there among the tortoises in the speed at which they move up and down the mountain? Are there, are there individuals that are, are faster than other individuals or are they all, to me they it all, seems like they're all pretty slow. But. They all charge around like maniacs. <laughs> Uh, um, um, considerable differences. Um, you know, uh, um, a migrating tortoise might uh, move up to about two kilometers a day. Um, that's an exceptionally fast day, usually several hundred meters. 
And sometimes during their sedentary phase, they might sit with their head buried in some vegetation for a week and not move. <laughs> so huge amounts of um, variation. But interestingly, when, when they decide to migrate, they're, they're at it. They're suddenly at it. Their, their movements become um, directed and, and, and uh, much more rapid. Really interesting. Um, so I think one sort of exciting component of your research is really the direct way that it relates to conservation on the ground. Um, and so I, I was curious about how responsive um, sort of the local managers, the managers are to your work and how that might compare uh, between sort of the Congo and the Galapagos and um, I guess perhaps less so um, with some of your North American or some of your research here in the United States, but. Right. Well, I, I, I've been lucky in, in, in the Congo, I, I quickly realized that I'm not upper level management or sort of director material. And I feel like I played a supporting role to people that were much better equipped to do politics and to do serious management. You could say that that's a cop out. Um, but uh, I think uh, if any of my colleagues are uh, tuned into this, they would agree. Um, so I, I think I've been primarily an information provider to uh, better skilled um, sort of directors and politicians than myself. Um, I like to feel that my work contributed to some major advances in buffer zone management around national parks within the Congo by showing how much space elephants need, by showing elephants live in large numbers outside of uh, protected areas. So with those data, um, there's traction from the conservation community to, to lobby for buffer zone management, management of wildlife in logging concessions and, and, um, and, um, and things like that. Um, on Galapagos, again, I feel we've been information providers um, we've got some pretty crystal clear recommendations to make, um, and these are, are um, listened to by the Galapagos National Park and local management authorities. Um, all I've done is sort of blow a lot of hot air about bison stuff, so it uh, would um, be nice if I actually got a couple of papers finished there and uh, and provided some useful information to the Nature Conservancy after all these years. What I would say is, um, in, in sort of summary to that, is that uh, yeah, I think you could you could you could get you could get the Minister of the Environment for Gabon, who's a friend of mine called Lee White. You could get him. You could get the director of the of the Galapagos National Park, and you could get the manager of Forest Park here in St. Louis together into a room and say, what are your biggest challenges? And I would bet seven out of 10 of their biggest problems are the same, whether you're dealing with um, Gabon, um, Galapagos or Forest Park in the middle of St. Louis. Um, one of the questions that came up while, while you're actually asking this is, um, is to, it challenges your, 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 your sentiment that you don't know how much or, or uh, how much good your own work has done. And, but so one of the people here was wondering sort of um, if you were to sort of start your career today in 2020, knowing what, you, what you've learned, which is, a, which is an immense amount about the movement ecology of these organisms, sort of how would you target your research um, sort of going forward to, to make it as impactful for some of the conservation implications as possible? Um, I, I do think I've been in, in terms of research, I do think, I do think I and the teams that I've been part of have actually have, have done some pretty reasonable conservation sort of applied research with strong conservation impacts. So I don't, I don't know that I would change the nature and the style of the research that I've done. Um, um, 
I think I would like to have been better at promoting the outputs of that research and seeing them um, go into implementation. Um, you know, the, 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 the problem in, say, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere like Central Africa, the, 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 um, the, the trivial amount of resources available for conservation, even though they're a lot more considerable than they were 10 or 20 years ago, relative to the scale of the threats bearing down on, the, on, on, on that region, uh, are, are so David and Goliath, it's, it's extremely hard to make um, real progress. And you know, the work that Wildlife Conservation Society and the other conservation NGOs in the Congo Basin with, with governments have done in, in, in securing national parks, for example, is absolutely fantastic. You know, we, we, we talk a lot of doom and gloom in, in the sort of conservation world, but, you know, over the last 25 years or something, I, I don't know, uh, tens of national parks have been created within Central Africa. Um, and that's a monumental event to get these big spaces into legislation. Unfortunately, um, going from the legislation to well-managed, well-run, well-protected areas with, with matrices of, of, of management on their exteriors um, is another question, especially when those forests are filled with, with such valuable resources on the global market. Um, so uh, we're at five o'clock now, so I think we're just going to go with one more question. Um, and we have someone here on the chat wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about how you um, involve sort of some of the local populations, especially children, in um, and sort of uh, engage them in your research and, and, and some of the potential conservation efforts that, that might come out of that or, or have already come out of that. I wanted to show some slides on that angle of our, of our work, but uh, this was more of a research talk. So uh, maybe we can do a, a more educationally one some other time, but um, it's, it, 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 it's a, such an important part of, of all of the work that I'm um, involved in that, that outreach and education go, go hand in hand with, with the research. If you, you know, do research and you publish it in fancy or not so fancy journals and, you know, half a dozen scientists read it, then where is it going in a conservation framework? Unless, of course, that information is fed to high level kind of decision makers. But even if you've got high level decision makers that are informed and making decisions, um, uh, people on the ground need to buy into conservation if it's to have any 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 legs at all. So um, on the Galapagos Islands, for example, we um, established an education program as soon as we started doing um, research. And that involved working with local schools to develop a website, um, to develop curriculum elements, to get kids up into the highlands, to be um, interacting with giant tortoises and doing some radio tracking, making maps, um, really involving um, kids within our research. Part of that involved um, supporting the Galapagos National Parks education programs and other institutional education bodies, like private and sort of public schools. Um, uh, an international program called Ecology Project International has been um, a very important user of the information that we've provided through research. So, um, so yeah, research goes hand in hand with education and outreach um, rather than being separate entities. Perfect. Um, so it's five o'clock. So I think we're going to go ahead and end um, this seminar. And I hope that everyone at home um, is thanking Dr. Blake in any way that they, they can um, in a remote sense. Um, and so I want to thank all of our viewers today for, um, for tuning in and watching this really interesting seminar. Um, there'll be another one 
uh, in a month um, that we will advertise uh, through the various Living Earth collaborative channels. Um, so once again, thank you all for uh, showing up today and I hope that uh, the rest of your week uh, it is uh, pleasant wherever wherever you are. <laughs>